town and location in the state. So, Gretchen, let's start with you. And I think Gretchen doesn't have a mic, so she's going to probably need to do it in um, chat. That's what I remember. Yeah. Okay. So we'll give her a chance to go into chat. Um, I will follow this alphabetically. I don't know. Well, well no, I will go on down to Regina Burgess while um, Gretchen is putting her information into chat. Let's see if you've got um, sound and if you would share your name, name of the library, name of town, and location in the state. Hi, this is Regina Burgess. I'm with the Panhandle Library Access Network in Panama City Beach, Florida, and we represent the Panhandle part of the state as a multi-type library cooperative. So then we'll we'll go on to one of your customers, one of your libraries. Uh, we'll, uh, Tabitha, you want to say hello? And let's see if you've got sound or whether you need to put it into chat. Um, and Sandy, Gretchen has uh, gotten her response in. She's saying that she is located in Hendry County, the town of Clewiston, uh, the community of Harlem. Right. And what's fascinating to me, years ago, uh, I don't remember, it was Avis rental car or somewhere, Harlem was a lot bigger on their map than Clewiston was at the time, <laughs> <laughs> which was just sort of interesting. It was one of the rental car places. So it's right next, she's right next to or right below um, Lake Okeechobee. Okay. Um, Tabitha is introducing herself at this point. Uh, it's Tabitha Washington at Gadsden County Public Library in Quincy, Florida. Thank you, Tabitha. So back up here in North Florida next to us. So I don't know if anybody else new has come on board. It doesn't look like it. Um, we've got Dale. Oh, yeah, Dale, okay, it's not showing up. Yeah. So yep, Dale, I'm here, yes. Uh, Dale Collum, Three Rivers Regional Library. We're a four-county cooperative uh, in the Big Bend area in between Tallahassee and Gainesville. Thank you, Dale. Anybody else? So we'll go ahead and get started with that. somebody else. Uh, no, you're clear, Sandy. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with our with our session. We have an idea of who can speak and who cannot. So Gretchen was uh, someone who actually sent a uh, confirmed that she had a topic she wanted to discuss. So what I want to do is go ahead and give her a chance to type that in so that we can um, uh, take a look at it. And then uh, while she's doing that, I wanted to point out to you that the um, state aid estimates have been posted on our webpage. We have the link on the agenda, and um, we'll be sending this out to you. Have any of you had a chance at this point, particularly those who can talk, to take a look at that list? I have not. Yeah, and what, you, what you'll see when you take a look at it, I think there was only four or six library systems that did not lose money. Um, I think some of yours, Dale, it came through okay. I didn't. I didn't track it down but um, and as uh, folks know who've been through this before this, this is an estimate of your state aid grant based on what the legislature uh, recently appropriated which was a pretty hefty cut and there's a couple of things for you to look at one is how accurate was the estimate that was turned in for your library system for your county uh, uh, last year and the more accurate that is, the more accurate the figure you're looking at is. But as we see, because the overall funding has um, has been cut, then uh, Dale, since I know you can talk, I'm real curious with your four counties, mm -hmm. how do they go into um, figuring out what budget figure they're going to put in for state aid when you actually don't solidly know it until December? What do, what do your counties do, Dale? Yeah, I think three of them kind of just go off of what they had, you know, from the last budget uh, time. And then if they have anything that's going to be affecting their county specifically, 
you know, they try to adjust for that, whether it's an up or a down. And then one of our counties is, is Lafayette County, which rides a yo-yo up and down every year. So who knows what their their uh, plan or logic is? Yeah, just this, this this particular year, um, y'all will want to take a look at those um, estimates. And as everybody knows, what I recommend and what's safer is to lowball it as much as possible. Because you can always go up with the budget, but it's a lot harder. You're three months into the year to actually go down. I've heard folks have historically used different strategies. If our funding was more stable, like when it was at the 32 million, some of those strategies actually, you know, like some of the big counties would actually average out three years and use that figure. But what I would really recommend is to lowball it as much as possible. I do know that there are some. Um, some counties that actually are spending last year's money in the current year, and you can carry it over. I think all of you know this, is that you can carry the um, state aid uh, funding over. And that seems to me to be a safe strategy if you, can, if you can work your way into it, particularly those of you with equalization. Any comments or questions with state aid? And then we'll jump to um, Gretchen. Um, well, who um, has any questions? Um, Gretchen's comment is, my question was, do others have any tips or suggestions as to what qualities to look for in the right candidate for open library positions? Good question, Gretchen. Um, and uh, Dale, I'm going to pick on you first while uh, the others who can type in uh, would please go ahead and type in your uh, responses to Gretchen's question while Dale talks about his perspective in working with his four counties and um, hiring for the cooperative, but also what his observations have been with the um, qualities of staff uh, that you're looking for. Okay. Um, and, and of course, it'll depend on what the job you're trying to fill, uh, what kind of skills and abilities you're looking for for each job, uh, public service jobs, you definitely want somebody with the right public service attitude, uh, whereas if you're doing a, a IT person or a cataloger, that might not be as important as more of their knowledge of, of what they're going to be doing. Uh, so, of course, your knowledge, skills, and abilities will, of course, play a, a big part in what you look at. Uh, the other thing that I always want to make sure is, this, you know, is this person going to be somebody that gets along with our other uh, people, our teammates? Um, you know, sometimes you can tell that, you know, perhaps their personality is just too brash or something that might cause friction in the workplace, uh, something to consider along that line. Uh, one of the things I always try to tell people that are uh, doing hiring in our organizations is uh, if you interview a bunch of people and you don't find the right candidate, um, a lot of times hiring somebody just to hire somebody turns out to be a bigger pain um, down the road if the you know a lot of times it turns out that they're you know the things that you were not liking when you were interviewing them you know come to the forefront later down the road and you have problems with that employee so um, you know we we try to have a thing where you know if we don't get a good candidate that we feel can do the job in our first time we try to you know say we need to re-advertise and I think that's actually getting a little bit stickier now with our our society everybody wants to sue everybody so you know a lot of times the hr people will kind of say no you know these people meet the minimum qualifications you have to hire somebody in which case yeah you kind of get stuck like okay mm -hmm. you know uh, we have to go with you know the the best that we can and hope for the best and um, while Gretchen may be doing some feedback or somebody else who is type, uh, typing, um, maybe Tabitha, you can maybe type something in from your observations as far as being over in Gadsden County and Quincy. Let's go to Regina. Just your perspective is somewhat different because you're actually in um, plan. You're in a, a cooperative system that supports and, and does a lot of continuing education um, uh, uh, programs for the, a lot of rural counties here in the Panhandle. What are your, some of your thoughts, Regina, on the question? Well, I think that um, 
you know, one of the most important qualities that I've always looked for when I've been hiring or what I would suggest people look for is the ability or the, the willingness to learn. Um, <laughs> and that kind of ties in with the continuing education. But if you have someone who uh, wants to uh, keep up with, you know, the library trends and, um, you know, also has a, a good grasp of the basics, then I think that, you know, you have a, a good employee that can grow with with your library. I think that's a very good observation. And, you know, since we're really talking with folks that are rural, one of the um, and one of the factors that sometimes is out there is that you have folks who are not big travelers. And yet, in a way, um, some of the best ways those folks learn is to mixing with other folks that are similar to them. And so that's been one of my observations um, uh, with it. I know whenever I, I worked in Northwest Regional, you know, one of your systems, and it was a six county system at the time, and the library director just absolutely expected us to um, to attend anything that was within a two-hour drive. So we, we actually came up here to um, uh, Tallahassee and over to Pensacola, and I know you have a lot of things that are in Niceville. Um, and basically what I would do is load up a, load up a car load. And uh, I'll tell on myself on this, at the time I was young when I went to Panama City, and um, I had a car, but I didn't have a, I only had my driver's permit, <laughs> my learner's permit. I didn't have, but I was always legal because I had somebody sitting next to me who actually had um, a drive, you know, a regular license. So I was always legal. And I, I got a chuckle one time because I took a carload of folks over to Jacksonville and they had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I knew Jacksonville because I'd ridden with my dad quite a bit in there, but that was the first time I'd ever driven into a city was whenever I, <laughs> nobody knew that. I kept that one a, a secret and finally did get my my, my permit there. Other other comments here? We have a comment from Tabitha who says, the best advice is to find someone who will mesh well. I have a small library system and that has been the best indicator of good employees. After it does that. That's a very good observation because you, you, you juggle things. Right? I talked on top of. I, I'm sorry, somebody was asking me a question. They just stuck their oh, head in the oh, door. Okay. I'm sorry, Sandy. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I just didn't want to talk all, on, on top of. I, yeah, and it's, it really is an, a delicate thing. The, um, the other somewhat of an observation, it's so hard with smaller libraries because you need that detailed person with the cataloging, but that cataloger also often works the front desk. And um, and it's it's a really delicate balance. I remember um, when I worked in um, as director in, in Monticello, Jefferson County, I had a really good person, and she was uh, you know really good at details, and she was actually relatively friendly. But a friend of mine who lived over there said she never smiled, and I you know I just thought that was an interesting observation in the sense of you know what you're looking for and the attitudes and the um, skills you need because you need such a such a um, you know you need the jack of all trades with small libraries and um, we can always go back to that Gretchen does that um, you want to put in your observations from the feedback that you've gotten from from folks today and then also I want to throw it open to is there a topic that another topic that you want to talk about this morning. I have some samples up here. Uh, one um, one thing I realized I didn't have is I didn't have friends or library boards there, but we have had some discussions on that. There is a free webinar that I just saw uh, Web Junction has posted, and it's about having a learning library board. Now. We know in Florida it's sort of an odd mix. We have advisory boards. We have, in the sense of Gadsden County, has an advisory board, whereas the um, 
Three Rivers has a governing board that's over the whole four county cooperative, so we really have quite a mix. But I did, uh, we do have the link, and we'll put that out there for an upcoming um, training. And the whole idea is, of course, our library boards, whether they're advisory or um, governing, need to lead the effort in the sense of being a learning learning entity. So I thought that was interesting. Does somebody want to bring up some another question or comment? Raise your hand. Um, Gretchen responded. She says, great ideas. I've written some of them down to refer back to later. Great. Great. Thanks, Gretchen. Any Anything else that, that you want to uh, bring up? Anything that's happened this week? Or how are things going with, you know, the smaller library with the budget? In, you know, moving in. So usually by May, June, small libraries especially really get into gear. Some of our larger ones actually start in January, February. I'm curious to see where everybody is with with that or with other with other aspects of library. Tabitha, While you're thinking. Uh, all right, Tabitha says we are just starting our process. Our first meeting is in May. Okay, and that's that seems to be relatively typical of the smaller libraries. They is that you really kick off things um, actually in in May. Uh, Dale and your your library systems is that typical for your four counties? It is. Uh, I was just talking to the Taylor County Administration uh, yesterday, and that's what was on their mind is you know it's budget time, but they haven't actually started doing the, the real nitty-gritty work on it yet. And what's happening with filling the um, director's position in Taylor? Yeah, you remember we talked about the uh, administrator had the idea to combine it into a community services that's over mm -hmm. parks and rec, boat ramps, uh, library, and all of that. And then he came back and said, now I've decided not to. And they have now, yes, decided to go forward with that. Oh. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> So, and it was really funny, the uh, the job ad that they uh, posted had like, you know, seven lines of the different duties, and it would talked about the ball fields and the, um, you know, boat ramps and all of that stuff. The very bottom line was uh, Manages County Library, and, and that was all that said about it. So, well, and it, it even got more funny we did the interviews for it yesterday they asked me to sit down in the interviews mm -hmm. and two of the three candidates they brought in you know just said oh i didn't know anything about the library i, I didn't know it was part of this <laughs> they didn't read the whole ad. yeah they didn't get down to the bottom line <laughs> I mean, yeah so yeah. it was rather interesting um but they actually did get at least one one lady that was a really good candidate just for her you know broad experiences she's had in other things so i'm, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful um. Yeah, and um, of course, it'd probably be a totally long shot that anybody would be hired to be able to attend the academy in um, in Orlando. That that'll be happening, but if if they happen to, um, that would be wonderful if they could send, because mm -hmm. you know, that person then would be exposed to a, a real mix of folks across the state, and particularly in the context of fundraising, which is always a big item for all of our libraries, but especially for our smaller ones. Right. And then our orientation for new directors will be in January this year. The um, directors meeting will be down in Brandon in October. Um, and so we're splitting the two up and the orientation will be uh, up here in Tallahassee in January. And that is one that we actually help um, with paying some travel for. So just as far as getting on people's on people's radar um, with that. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Say we've got a small group. This is your chance to throw some things out. Um, what you're working on. Uh, Tabitha, I know you're doing some strategic planning. You want to um, put something into, you know, so. Um, into your chat because it'd be interesting how the strategic planning ties back to the whole budgeting process, you know, uh, there. And um, uh, Tabitha, Go ahead. sorry, Go ahead. Tabitha says we yes we had our five year plan retreat this past Saturday. 
Interesting. I'd like to see here how that went. Why don't you put a little bit of, you know, what are what are some of the planning trends? What came out of it? What what was your observation on how that on how that retreat went? Um, and then what I'm also curious about is anybody else that's in on this call um, working on um, their their long range plan, strategic plan. Uh, it is a requirement for a system, now in Dale's case, it could be one plan for the four counties, to actually have a plan that covers three to five years and that is approved by the um, <clears throat> uh, governing board. And in the case of with Dale, the governing board is made up of representatives from um, his four counties, but in the sense of uh, Gretchen down in um, Harlem, she that's a member library of the Henry County Cooperative. And in their case, the governing board is the city of Clewiston. They're just, I think they're one of the last county systems that are actually managed by a city. So anybody else working on planning? Tabitha says, Dr. Dina Hurst of FSU is the facilitator. We came up with a lot of programming ideas and promotional ideas for a small budget. We looked at ideas for fundraising, such as looking at local and corporate sponsors. Excellent. Yeah, it'll be interesting to, to see the trending, especially from the small library perspective of uh, where, um, where libraries are, are going. And of course, it's to meet your community needs, so it does get impacted by the what's happening in, in your case, in, in Quincy, uh, in that area. Um, um, with that, so yeah, it'll be it'll be uh, interesting to see what how your plan uh, shapes out. Uh, Tabitha, are you doing it for three years or five years? And while she's answering that, for five. Um, uh, Tabitha says for five. For five, yeah, that's yeah. What what we end up finding, you it it makes life simpler if you go ahead and do it for five years because then you aren't under the gun. <laughs> but we also find that. Really, after you get past the third year, the first year is you know, pretty solid because you, you're going into it with it being fresh. And the second year, you're still sort of moving forward. By the third year, you're, you're sort of revamping things. And by the time you get to the fourth or fifth year, a lot of the things that you thought three years ago. But for meeting our requirements, that is totally, absolutely appropriate, and I'd be doing that too. Because <laughs> it means one last thing you have to worry about unless you really want to. And what's also as cool is the fact that you do an annual plan of service every year. So that's certainly another way to update to update your plan. And Regina, why don't you? Uh, what are some of the trending things that uh, workshops are are? webinars or whatever that you're doing over for the um, plan area that um, are coming up. I know y'all do a rural conference. Is that scheduled for next year tentatively? We don't have that scheduled for next year um, yet. We're, that's something that you know we'll look into after um, we finalize our LSTA uh, grant process, right. which right. Uh, the, you know the panel's next um, next week. Um, right, but right. one thing we've been working on this year is we have a, a plan library 101 series, which yeah. follows the uh, web junction core competencies. Uh, and this is for all library staff in the state of Florida attending webinars and just to make sure that um, all library staff have the, the basic core competencies um, that web junction, you know, suggest. And that's been going really well. And we've already had, I think, about three or four webinars, and uh, we'll have a total of 13 by the end of it. And uh, everyone will get a certificate of um, attendance um, if they either attend the live webinar or view the recording. Because, of course, um, you know, with the way schedules are, especially in small libraries, you you can't always attend the the live. Um, webinar so and uh, we've got some um, other some soft skills um, you know listening skills how to turn patrons into cheerleaders we have one only one conference left this fiscal year which is the plan FLA mini conference and that's going to be August 24th 
Uh, we've got a great keynote speaker, Shola Richards, is going to talk about positivity in the workplace and uh, how we can how we can all improve our work life, which I think is very important. And we've already got some of the um, sessions that which will be at the the main FLA conference in Orlando. We've got them scheduled to come at and speak at our conference too, so that our members who can't travel to Orlando will be able to get at least some of that information. Great, Great. that sounds good. And I'm I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the new Taylor County director is Dale, whether you have any influence with the county there to develop a training plan for uh, for anybody that's new to libraries, um, some expectations that they um, have a strong continuing education plan? Um, we, yeah, we do actually have uh, some things that we have in place for any of our new managers that are coming on, and then things that uh, we have for any of the new employees, including managers, uh, of, you know, set of skills that they need to know to work in our libraries. Um, so they will, yeah, get some, some some kind of training and background to to get them started. Mm -hmm. Right. That sounds sounds good. And one of the things, as y'all know, because y'all most of y'all have been through it, is I do a um, using this, you know, go to meeting and um, and the phone. I do a one on one orientation which is usually ends up being two hour, two different sessions, especially for a system like your your Three River system, which is more complex than a standalone consolidated kind of system. Um, as as another thing, but um, I know as as we as we bring people in with totally new, um, um, totally new into libraries. Uh, there's just so many things that, I mean, what's nice, Dale, is that they have you as a, a leader of the of Three Rivers, but at the same time, <clears throat> it's just interesting how our um, how our systems are getting folks that have less and less library experience. So the real trick is <clears throat> if they have the enthusiasm and the wanting to learn, as we just heard earlier, <clears throat> then it's fine. You know, they need to you know, certainly be curious and they need to be supportive because there's got to be some travel money as well as just some off the desk time that will be interesting having somebody run all those other parts of the Taylor County along with the library. <laughs> right. And I actually suspect that, uh, you know, a lot of the things that go into that as far as scheduling ball tournaments and use of parks and stuff are going to devolve into be, yeah, see the library to get it scheduled. So, mm -hmm. You know, suddenly the library is going to be the place people call to, to reserve a pavilion at a park or something. All right, and the fun part would be how do we con how do we um, conjole them into also getting a library card while mm -hmm. they're scheduling the um, sure. park? Yeah, with with challenges <laughs> come opportunities, of course, right? Absolutely. So so how grab grabbing that um, opportunity there? Yeah. Any anything else? And so in, I know we have a small group, and I think Tabitha's got some other things. I don't. Yeah, I think she's actually. We may have already read those. There, I think you did. Anything else for the good of the order, and um, <laughs> and anything as far as suggestions for um, our continuing education for other discussions for future discussions or for um, just CE in general, in the sense of at a statewide level and then at, at, and then at a local level, as we've been hearing lots of good stuff that you're doing over and um, plan with, from Regina. I'll do an ad for Nephlin. Mm -hmm. They do. have a library maker fest happening um, and it's going to be on May 4th, which is a Friday at the Clay County Fairgrounds. Um, and the Maker Fest has been held down in kind of central South Florida uh, last few years. And I think they've had a really good um, you know, turnout from different libraries. So Nephlin has got it this year. So if anybody wants to go attend that, it should be very interesting. 
Um, another thing that I'd point out is if you've got a manager coming in who has no experience in libraries at all, Web Junction has a program called ABLE in their courses. Um, it is self-paced. It's there all the time, but it takes you through the basics of what it is to be in a library. So it shows you the basics of cataloging and kind of brings them up to speed with all the different terminology. That's great. And um, I see we've had um, another director from the Panhandle has joined the session. And <clears throat> we'll find out, Dan, whether you've got voice or whether you are um, need to chat. Want to share, why don't you introduce yourself and share um, your name, name of library, name of the town, and location in the state, and anything that um, anything else you want to share in the sense of where you are. And also, do you have any um, topics that you want to make sure that uh, that you bring up with your colleagues today? And find out, see if, if, if Dan has voice. Um, Dan is typing into chat. He says, Dan Owens, Walton County Public Library System, DeFuniac Springs. Excellent. And I do know we have a couple of our colleagues. Uh, they're, they're doing double duty, I'm sure. And um, Emily? Oh. I'm here. Yeah. No, I've lost my go-to training. Okay, go ahead and um, go ahead and um, why don't you introduce yourself, Emily, and say a little bit of what you do, and um, um, and then you did, then Jana, if she's on on this too. So I, to um, to for those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Emily Hart. I am the Equal Access to All consultant here with the Bureau of Library Development, which uh, encompasses both the E-Rate program, um, which I know is a, a dirty word almost sometimes, uh, but also the um, underserved populations uh, section of our, our Pro areas that we like to serve. And um, one of the underserved populations that we are focusing on are uh, rural and small libraries because you guys are, are frequently people that we would like to, to do more with and um, help more. So I'm mostly here today just to kind of listen in and, and hear about the, the state of things and um, how that's going and kind of get a feel for what the field is doing right now. Thank you. Um, We've got a question. Go ahead. Dan Owens says, I'm interested in makerspace programs. Anybody uh, in on this call doing some things or considering doing some things um, related to the, you know, I, and, I think especially in the rural libraries, but also I think it's true in even larger libraries that makerspace has really broadened as far as definitions go. Any thoughts or observations of what you're doing? Um, one of the things that uh, that initially, since it start makerspace has started in larger libraries, and you thought you thought technology, but in actual fact, there's so many different ways you do do makerspaces in a in a rural library. You can have just your little red wagon. With all your craft stuff and code, you know whatever, whatever kind of maker stuff, you know it doesn't have to be the heavy duty room. I mean, even large libraries have found that they don't necessarily need to have a separate room. That it actually works better in some ways to have something much more portable and and sort of out out with people. So, what are people's um, observations on makerspace? Do any of you have anything? Or are considering setting up anything? Or seen something you thought was cool that might you consider? We're not doing anything um, specifically called makerspaces in our libraries. Uh, we do have several community groups that do use our libraries or our meeting rooms that do that kind of activity as far as sewing or, or knitting, um, some things like that. Uh, but we haven't actually gotten any actual spaces that we, we call a makerspace. 
Um, this is Regina. I know when I was at Northwest Regional Library System, uh, we had received a grant to do mobile maker spaces since we were a three county system and, um, you know, two of the counties, Liberty and Gulf are very rural. What, what we would do is we, we had a, like a, a set of six totes full of the different makerspace things like the Sphero balls or just Lego education kits or, you know, just fun things like that. And we would just rotate them on the courier so that all the patrons in the different areas would, would get a little taste of them um, so we could share, share what we had. And, and in doing that, what were some learning, you know, what did you, what were some of your learning factors in putting together the kits and advice for somebody else looking at wanting to do something similar or learning from what you're, from what y'all did? Yeah, I think the, probably the biggest learning curve was um, actually the, in, the inventory of each tote, um, <laughs> making wondering. sure that everything got back, um, you know, and also making, making sure that, each library sent on their totes when it was their time or else, you know, things would get out of order and some libraries wouldn't have anything and some libraries would have too much. So uh, it's just some, you know, just little strategic things that you work out. But uh, I think, it, it, you know, it worked really well with um, and and then all the, the staff and the patrons got different things to look at. Any other thoughts or, or observations related to the the concept of um, makerspace and the fact that it can be a lot broader than what, as I say, originally I think people thought 3D printers and a dedicated space in the library and needed to, to do this and, and whereas it, it seems to me, and I know over in um, Taylor County, they never would have called it a maker space, but in a way, they actually had quilting. And the quilt club, I think, met there mm -hmm. and still, I think, does, don't they? With sure, the they do, yes. Uh -huh. So so in actual fact, our small libraries um, have been doing things like maker spaces that just didn't have a cool tag to it. Right. <laughs> so yeah. they call that quilting space a maker space. They're just making quilts. <laughs> um, and when you start to design a maker space first or – start thinking about entering the makerspace area, and this is Brendan, by the way, um, start to figure out what your purpose behind going into it is, and that'll help you get started. Um, Dan, was there a particular purpose you're trying to reach? I'll let Dan type in. I think that's what he's needing to do with that. Um, as in, are you trying to do something with the sciences, the math, are you trying to connect with schools, or are you just trying to bring more people into the library? Um, that's what I'm meaning by purposes. Because mm -hmm. it would be, you know, the whole cooking classes that and gardening and all that, you mm -hmm. know, is, is certainly something that fits the rural communities. And there are some really fantastic programs that people are doing with those kind of um, resources of the gardening. Um, one of the counties, I believe it is Lake, is doing um, Life Hack Academy is what they call it. And really they're just teaching um, teens in particular um, different makerspace type things, such as working on cars, how to cook for themselves, uh, basic sewing. Um, but it all falls under the makerspace category. Yep. As I say, I think there's... There's lots of things that libraries have been doing that just haven't been labeled as, as such. Um, and lots of things that even small libraries can do. Um, and just just branding it as a little cooler and <laughs> exciting. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Dan responded back. Uh, no, we what have no response from him yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we're about we're 40 minutes into our session. We can certainly go until uh, noon. And a lot of it depends. I know we've got a small group here. I don't think anybody else has popped in. Jenna, 
I don't know if you are listening. I know you had signed in earlier. <clears throat> Do you want to say a little bit? And I'll wait a minute or two to see if she's there. Well, <clears throat> one of the things I, I, I'll tell you what one of the things that I'm working on is um, we're putting together a library literacy um, planning group that will be meeting in June. And what this group will be doing is um, developing a three-year plan for uh, library literacy across the state. We'll be doing some face-to-face -face workshops this uh, coming year at the game plan right now. And then, then based on their input, we'll be doing some more um, support and continuing education and maybe some other things the next two years after that. So we'll actually have that, that plan in play. <clears throat> and one of the things this group is going to be doing is we do have, let me throw this question out there. Um, do any of you have um, the book discussion kits that some libraries are doing? I think it's harder for smaller libraries because it certainly has a cost to it to provide like five copies of a book all in one kit. And then keeping up with the kit, as Regina said earlier, is, is always something there. But I do know that there are libraries that are checking out book discussion kits to um, you know, to people if they want to do them in a home or at the local bar or wherever they want to do it. Uh, we actually are, have uh, uh, two kits that we're going to be putting out there to be field tested. One is for English language learners, and the whole idea is to do short stories with English language learners. So the story actually would be read out loud, and then they would have a discussion around literacy, you know, literacy, I mean, around literature, which is, you know, a new experience for 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 many folks. Uh, then we also have a manual, uh, a tutor and a provider's manual for family literacy, and we'll be using Uncle um, Uncle Mundy's the title of the book, the folk folk tales about Florida. And so we'll be having folks who'll be field testing that, and then we'd actually have the kits available um, uh, across the state and updated kits um, by the. Um, by next year. So that's another thing that we're working on. Okay. Um, we have a comment from Dan Owens. He said, these are good ideas. It made me think of holding a drone program, asking people to bring their drones to the library's parking lot for a competition <laughs> and expand the program into building drones. Cool. Uh, that sounds uh, like a wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you might look at is talk with your local um, aviation group. Uh, there's always one around. Um, and just make sure that your library is not in a fly zone that might cause some issues with height. Um, so there are some limitations on what drones can do. Um, also talk with them because they can come add to that program and get people registered um, believe it or not, most people don't know it, but you must register your drone with the aviation, uh, National Aviation Group. Um, so that gives them an opportunity to come in and show people that there is a registration process, um, which takes 30 seconds, as well as you get to know whether or not your library is in the no drone zone. <laughs> the no drone zone? <laughs> Love it. This is Jana. Um, first of all, Dan, um, it should be congratulated for his library system because the Coastal Branch Library won the State Teen Video Challenge Award. Oh, Yay! <laughs> um, it was really great. And that can be up on, if you go to the flip page and go through all the great stuff that's going on, the Teen Video Challenge video is there. The winner is there along with the link to all the other states that have participated in the, the national program. Um, also, civil libraries had a little extra gift this week, so I'm very happy to have them participate in some additional um, orders for summer materials. We had, um, were able to help some people out. Um, the I'm looking for people who have lived through the summer programs or used FLIP so that we have a FLIP 50 page, which is the 50th anniversary this year 
of the Florida Library Youth Program. And I know there are people that are in your community or your library staff that have um, worked through it. And if they have any particular memories of any kinds of programs that they'd like to supply a paragraph or two with, I would love to have that. So thanks in advance. Thanks, Jana. Um, I was thinking about the the um, I mean, yeah the the flip programs done such so many good and cool things over the years. It definitely would be nice to. Um, I think Florida's got one of the older um, support statewide youth program. Am I right, Jana? Yeah, we're one of the few. We don't think we're the oldest, but we're close to it. Yeah, that's I. I mean, Florida is a young state, so we can't. <laughs> can't <close. laughs> it's easy that Texas has is older. Is it? Yeah. I think, but um, if you go on the flip 50 page, what we've got is we've got, I've got people who have contributed some memories already, which is kind of cool. Um, and also um, the artwork that we have developed for the flip 50 that you can use um, in whatever capacity, as well as different kinds of, there are some coloring sheets and also the some program ideas that have been taken out of past manuals and um, kind of updated a little bit and freshened up a little bit and put up on the website so it's cool wonderful that's really good and i was thinking also back to dan's idea of the drones the interesting part about the panhandle is we have tyndall, tyndall air force base and eglin air force base so i bet there are a good number of, of folks and retirees and young folks that um that it could be a really interesting mix of a program just to make sure that you're legal and safe as we <laughs> as we heard from brendan <laughs> um we've got about 10 more minutes i don't you know, we don't need to necessarily stay in. Anybody else have anything you want to bring up? I think what we can do is, um, if you feel like you've gotten your uh, gotten some good stuff out of this, or you've gotten your comments or questions answered, or, or some of the ideas have got you thinking, we can officially um, end the um, session now with the idea that maybe I and Emily and Jana, as well as our folks staffing the um, the webinar, um, can stay on board for sort of side conversations kind of thing. But we can officially end the um, the, the session. And if you would, as you uh, sign out, if there's any other things you would like to know about that you would like to be covered in whatever different ways, if you would put some of your thoughts in chat, that would really be appreciated. And maybe put in some chat some things that you learned today that you're thinking about, like what Dan did in the sense of, oh, thinking about drones. Hmm. Um, we'd like to hear from you on the the value of these kind of discussions and how we can make them better for you. I have a question for the group. I'm just curious to know how your physical spaces in your libraries have changed and adapted as we moved into a more technological era. You know, as their space shifted more to um, having more technology and less other physical items, or has it stayed the same? Yeah, this is Dale. Um, we have been working uh, along those lines to make those kind of shifts. Uh, Gilchrist Library just recently did the renovation and, and, and had the building uh, grant. So as part of that, we did you know make more room for uh, not only technology, but some you know, quiet study rooms and kind of things like that in that library. Um, and our other libraries are kind of you know seeing where that's going and uh, cutting back on some of the space for collections and adding space for other things. Interesting. What about other locations? You know, what about <clears throat> Gadsden County and Quincy and um, 
uh, Dan out in the, the panhandle. Um, could chat some. You could drop some things into into chat. And then Regina, any observations that that you might want to make from sort of the panhandle area? We'll give folks a chance to do some typing in. Tabitha says it has kind of stayed the same, but I see a need for more space. I think in Gadsden County there are one, two, three, three libraries, Havana, Chattahoochee, and one in in Quincy. Tabitha says, yes, three. Um, and Dan says, we have taken out two sections of reference to make a room for a service desk. So raising the profile of the staffing as opposed to the, the print, the old fashioned print collection. And of course, with so much of that now being available through for electronic library, through various online stuff, they certainly are gaining some space from the old fashioned fat reference books that we had when I was out in the real world. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it is true. Yeah, yeah. So we don't work as service does. <laughs> Yeah, need for the need for more space is well and how does how do your staff feel about all of this change they're all for it i mean because we've got multi-generational people working in the libraries especially in rural libraries where you have such a large variety a large mix of people that have been there for ever if you will and new people coming on board that are a different generation how do they feel how do they work out with all of these changes that are going on. I'm thinking about Gretchen's question at the beginning about staff development and hiring staff. So I'm curious about some of her thoughts. And I don't know uh, how many staff you actually have in Harlem um, down there, but other folks too. Yeah, and I think we have, you know, mixed. We have people that any change of any kind is, is, is bad and they don't want to see it. And then other people that are just saying, why haven't we changed already? We need to keep moving forward. Uh, so it's all across the board as far as, you know, that kind of change goes in our libraries. How do you deal with the, the people that say they don't want to change? Oh, well, you know, one of the things is you if you can show them how it's making things better uh, either for them or for the patrons, um, how it's making it more efficient, how it's needed, hopefully, you know, they can get on board and, and understand. Um, and if not, you know, the change is still going to happen with or without them. Um, but it, it'd be better if you can get them on board and have it with them. True. Absolutely. Certainly a changing world, um, and I know the it's harder with the smaller library. Well, it's, it's interesting. One could say it's harder, but on the flip side, it's easier because you have less. You um, can do things a lot faster when you're in a small library, and so you can make changes a whole lot faster than if you're in a great big big library that you know you have to run things through a lot of different people. Right. Um, so if you have the right people that can come to, you know, can see it being fun and, you know, something sort of different that they, that will make, enhance their job, then makes it easier for them to take on board. And I guess one of the strategies to some degree is um, having staff, and I know y'all have been doing this and know it even better than I, uh, use their strengths. So if, I'll go back to the quilting story, but, you know, if, if you have staff that um, enjoy a particular aspect of something, and then they can bring it in as something new and different. That's rewarding them, making their job more fun, by also changing some of the services and ways things are done in the smaller library. 
Um, Gretchen has a comment. She says, space is not something we have an issue with. I believe this library is 1,800 square feet. That's quite a good size. And Gretchen's library is in an old, um, I think it's still the same location, old media specialist of a uh, school, I think an elementary school there is, is where her library is located. And I know for small libraries it's really something that the whole weeding of the collection is huge because often you don't get new space very much so making sure you have a fresh collection and then of course you have to have the book budget to, to buy it but the interesting thing now is so much as things become more and more virtual the um the idea of the uh, uh the ebooks certainly has lessened the space i saw something on PubLib where there was a library it wasn't in florida actually very proactively went out to the schools and issued what I'll call a technology card, so that the students in those schools could um, access all the virtual stuff. And they even had one of the students who actually called the director and say, thank you so much. And that really has helped raise their, their circulation, which is one of the things that they wanted to do. And I thought that, hmm, that's a uh, seemingly yeah, simple thing. Go ahead. Yeah, we're doing that here. We call it our e-card. And we got mm -hmm. all four of our school districts uh, on board with that. So all of the, the middle and high school students get them. And then one of the school districts even wanted their elementary kids to have them, so they do too. And what would be interesting is to track the circulation. How, oh, how it, did that? Yeah, the like e-books exploded uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> with that, yeah. Gretchen says, yes, they combined the original library and the cafeteria and the former office spaces together to form this current library space. Okay, great. Yeah, I hadn't remembered the um, the cafeteria and the office spaces as well as the former library. Okay, we're down to uh, had a really good conversation. Thanks to everybody who's contributed, and um, the um, um, one of the things that will be coming up, the Career Online High School, we're going to be doing a like, panel discussion webinar for any libraries that are new to Career Online High School. That's going to be on May 17th. And so be on the lookout for that announcement if any of you are, are interested in starting up the uh, Career Online High School. That was one thing that was funded by the um, legislature this year that will be happening. So I will officially um, convene this meeting. As I say, we'll, I'll, we'll stay on a little longer. And so if anybody wants to do the usual, the one thing we lose with this kind of meeting across the state is that sidebar car conversation that you have in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, the communication part of it because we all have different interests and needs. I mean, somebody would probably be touching base with Dan right now about the drones. <laughs> <laughs> so like I say, I'm we'll stay on, but as far as officially our our discussion is at an end.